Miami just beat the top-seeded Utah Jazz for the second time this season already, and this time it was without Jimmy Butler. Yes, they lost three games on their LA Western Conference road trip, but this video shows you why they're going to be overwhelming to beat all season and into the playoffs. Kyle Lowry's first triple-double with the Heat came in the first win against Utah, and Kay Lau starting to heat up after a rough month of October. Those two combined with Bam Bam, with Jimmy Butler playing like an MVP when he's been healthy, gives Miami one of the most dangerous big fours in all of basketball. Here's every reason for why that and much more make Miami overwhelming to beat, and stay tuned to see if they're the early East favorites. Before continuing, only 24.5% of you watching are subscribed, so please subscribe. Also leave a thumbs up on this video, it takes a few seconds and makes a massive difference. Back on November 2nd, when the Heat beat the now 4th seeded Dallas Mavericks by 15 points, the team had a record-setting night, which displayed how many all-star caliber players that Miami has. In that game in Dallas, Miami had 4 players score at least 22 points for the first time in franchise history. Mr. Buckets, K. Lau, Bam Bam, and Boy Wonder combined for 92 points, leaving Dallas scratching their heads, but after that win, Butler had this to say, Everybody is so stoked and excited whenever somebody else would make a shot or get a big stop. With this group, we really do enjoy each other's success like that. That quote really goes a long way because with super teams with a similar amount of talent to Miami throughout recent history, superstar egos almost always come into play. Just think of the Dwight Howard, Steve Nash, Kobe Bryant trio, the big three version of the Heat back in 2010. That took a year of losing in the finals before they could figure out who was the guy between D. Wade and LeBron. When LeBron returned to Cleveland, it took a year for his super team with Kyrie and Love of losing in the finals, not just with Miami or with LeBron, but with recent super teams assembled across the NBA. It always takes time. Just think of what's going on in Brooklyn right now. Injuries aside, Harden, KD, and Irving have three of the biggest egos in the NBA. So even in a playoff run where all three are healthy, that's going to be something Steve Nash is going to have to manage. Every individual on this Heat team seems to not care about who's the number one option or most efficient player on any given night. As Jimmy said, this team is rooting for each other. Out of all the coaches in the NBA, Eric Spolstra may have the best combination of motivational speaking and knowledge about how the advanced analytics affect the outcome of a game. The man has worked his way up from being in Miami's film room to being the head coach, but good on Pat Riley for keeping him around because Spo's turned into an absolute gem of a man in charge. Speaking on the Heat's early success, Eric said, quote, I think the most important thing is your offensive efficiency. It's two things. Are you getting to your strengths and are you doing it efficiently? That's regardless of whether you're getting it from the three-point line, the free throw line, or at the rim. We have a team that has a ton of aggression bent by nature, so we want to play to that. As teams and defenses start adjusting, we have the three-point spacing and shooting that, when it's needed, we might have some games where we shoot 45 to 50 attempts to keep the defense honest. We just have to take what's given. Moving on to the former NBA champion and a top 10 point guard in the game today, Kyle Lowry, who may have only shot 33% in his opening month in the red, black, and white, but K. lau has been getting praise from his teammates the minute he arrived in South Beach. In your perspective, how do you think having Kyle is going to help, you know, elevate Bam's game a little further? Because you've always mentioned that um, there's still a bigger ceiling for Bam to reach. Uh, I think Kyle's just damn near a genius when it comes to knowing how to get people the ball and um, playing his role to a to a T. Um, he takes a lot of the pressure off of myself, off of Bam, and you just get to go do what you do. Um, a facilitator, he guards, he shoots the ball well, he can finish, he gets to the line. Um, so obviously that's what we need, that's what we want here. But um, I think he gets he gives Bam the room to just go and be who you are and not worry about too much else. In the month of November, Kyle's picking it up after his early woes and is playing like the bulldog who can just put his head down and muscle his way inside. Lowry's averaging a solid 16 points this month on 47% shooting from the field and 36% from deep. The Raptor legend did have an 0 for 8 showing against Denver in a 113-96 loss, but other than that game, Kyle's been starting to play like an elite point guard again 
Don't forget, this man made the All-Star team six straight times with Toronto from 2015 to 2020, and he scored nearly 30 points in a title-clinching Game 6. Now Kyle's trying to help the Heat return to the finals and avenge their loss in the bubble. His experience, shooting stroke, muscle, defense, and most importantly, his passing makes the Miami Heat a different animal. Butler's ankle sprain against the Lakers has seen the all-NBA talent basically miss the last three games as he got hurt midway through the Heat's first game of a back-to-back -back in LA. But before Jimmy got injured, he was playing like an MVP candidate. Jimmy's averaging the most points per game of his career since 2016-17 at 23.6. He's boosting his three-point efficiency by five percentage points, and his 52.7% shooting stroke from the fields is also a career best. Evidently, with the arc he's getting on his jumper and how he's getting to his spot fluently, we're seeing a much fresher Jimmy Butler. He did seem worn down last spring in the 21 playoffs, but a full near half a year offseason that he just got, as opposed to the four weeks and then training camp that he had after the bubble, that's allowed Butler to regain form and significantly elevate his production this year. The developed Tyler Harrow has really helped out both Butler and Lowry this season. Boy Wonders pulling up for distance daggers and draining them with ease without hesitation like an all-star in his prime. I love the way Harrow's steadily increased his scoring, going from 13.5 points per game in year one to 15.1 in year two, and with his rookie and sophomore years under his belt, Tyler's taken that experience he's gained and put it to good use, posting an efficient 21.5 points per night, now in year three. What's really developed during the Kentucky product's time in the pros is his shot creation. The player I'm watching swiftly transition from dribble combos to pull up triples isn't the player who I saw back in 2019 when he was a 19 year old. Additionally, he's doing a much better job navigating through screen and roll scenarios. Overall, against the biggest and most talented defenses, man's become a way more comfortable pull up jump shooter and he's mixing those pull ups well with attacks to the basket. Since he was drafted, Bam Adebayo's versatility has worked to redefine what it means to be a center in the pros. He can guard all five positions, he's an excellent passer, and an extremely solid mid-range shooter and post-up player. Adebayo is one of one. He's unselfish, a guy whose athletic energy has discovered new ways to dismantle the traditional norms on a basketball court. So far in 21-22, Bam's been unreal posting 20 points, 11 boards, and 3 dimes, shooting 50% from the field, and 84% from the charity stripe. From an opposing big man's perspective, they're probably having nightmares before facing Adebayo because his energy and size make him impossible to keep off the glass. Miami having such a mobile, overpowering presence up front in BAM, makes the center as crucial as any other player the Heat have. As of this recording, the Heat have lost three of four games, of course taking their last one against Utah. The squad currently sits as the number five seed in an Eastern Conference looking unusually strong. They only have a decent record of eight and five, but the Heat have taken down some tough competition in their wins. They've beat the Bucks, the Nets, the Mavericks, and as I mentioned before, the Utah Jazz twice. Utah was number one in the West last year, they're eight and five as well, so to have already taken two games from them is huge. So does that make the Miami Heat the early East favorite? While the teams dropped a few games recently on their West Coast road trip, they dealt with some injuries early on, but I expect them to go on a win streak once Jimmy returns. Harden and Durant in Brooklyn are no joke whatsoever, and maybe the Nets get Kyrie back before the postseason, but their star power, along with one of the best perimeter defenders in the world in P.J. Tucker, who helped win the Bucks the title. Also, Duncan Robinson's another X Factor. He just dropped in six triples. This man can win you a playoff game with that scoring. So I'm going to say yes. As early favorites, I'd say the Heat are just that. But in your opinion, are the Heat East favorites? Best answer gets next video shout out. Last video shout out goes to Ona who says D Rose is his favorite player on my top 10 list yesterday. Appreciate the great take Ona. Ona leads the way in Community Speaks and he along with three others with the most shout outs are going to receive NBA merchandise in the holiday season. So leave your take on today's question to compete. This was D Flow and I'll see you next video.